Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. 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 Having that conversation happens. Telling us about time convergence in the solid state. Thank the organizers again. You should thank Clay. And Clay, definitely. So, the purpose of this talk is um, basically to take a very initial first step towards maybe trying to find some next questions to ask now that so much is known about the solder tape injection through work of Taylor and many other people. So I'll tell you the main purpose of the talk. The second purpose is to give some illustrations about how um, visualization could be useful in fairly abstract areas of number theory in ways that we don't usually use it. So um, here's the basic definition. You have an elliptic curve E. Throughout the entire talk, it will be assumed to not have complex multiplication. And um, you consider the numbers a sub p, which are p plus 1 minus the number of points in the curve. There's a theorem of Passa which says that if you normalize them by dividing by 2 root p, you get numbers that are between minus 1 and 1. So for each prime number p, you have a number between minus 1 and 1. So you can ask, how are these numbers distributed? In other words, if you say, look at all primes up to 1,000, you get a whole bunch of numbers between minus 1 and 1. And you can draw a little. Um, and a bar chart which shows how many of the numbers are in each little interval between minus 1 and 1. And you'll get some bar graph. And you can just keep doing this to up to 10,000, 100,000, and so on. What's your picture going to look like after a while? Um, suitably normalized, so the area under the bars is 1. Um, since neither Sato or Tate are here today, I have a picture of each of them at the bottom. Tate's down the block. Yeah, yeah. 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 he was here for the rest of the he was at talk this. this morning. Yeah, I guess he already knows about the solid heat. <laughs> <laughs> and I kind of uh, gave him this talk a few days ago. Um, so first I'm going to start out by showing you a bunch of um, graphs of the distribution I just described in words. So what I did was I took, of just for a variety, I took nine different elliptic curves. The first known elliptic curves of rank 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. Just to kind of show you how the convergence to the Sato Tate conjecture, as you'll see, um, may depend somewhat on the curve itself. And these curves have you know, different properties because their rings are so different. So in each case, I'm going to show you nine plots. And it's a three by three grid. And it starts with rank 0, rank 1, rank 2, and so on. So the grid is. So this is the curve 11a of rank 2. And what I did was I computed. What's wrong? I mean, sorry. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. The curve 11a of rank 0. Um, I computed for each prime up to 10 cubed, I mean, Harry computed a sub p. And then I took the numbers a sub p and divided them by 2 square root of p. And I got a whole bunch of numbers between minus 1 and 1. I then took those numbers and I counted how many were in this little interval right here. I made a, a bar there. I counted how many were close to 0. There were a lot, actually. They were close to 0. I put a bar there. And at the end of the day, I got this graph. Um, the red thing, this is a semicircle, and it's normalized that the area under this is 1. Okay? So that's for a rank 0 curve. Here's the first rank 1 curve, 37a, a similar picture. The first rank 2 curve, rank 3 curve, rank 4 curve, rank 5 curve, and so on, <laughs> to the first known rank 8 curve. Okay? <coughs> Is there, is, are these pictures completely crystal clear to everybody? Excellent. I'm not quite sure why you have a semicircle. Well, <laughs> you shall soon find out. Um, so we go to the next page. Whoops. Okay, so this is exactly the same picture, but instead of going up to 1,000, I've gone up to 10,000. And as you can see, I also shrunk the size of the intervals a little bit. And at least over here, the, the data is starting to look a little nicer, but it's still real-world data, so it's kind of chunky. Real-world in the sense of nothing to <laughs> Here's going up to 10 to the fifth. So here, things are smoothing out a bit more. more. And notice that, to address Mark's comment, notice that the graph 
that we're plotting looks more and more like a semicircle. Uh, though, if you look, say, at the upper left, it's kind of really close to this semicircle, whereas down here, the data seems somewhat skewed to the left. So there's like more white here, more blue here, whereas here it's about. Okay, so the convergence doesn't happen in exactly the same way for any old elliptic curve. Looks like you get more out of Yep. I can't see your question. There's more of a bias towards it not immediately being a solid tape conjecture or towards a high rank. That was his comment. Delta infinity 
It's just the L2 norm of the difference of these two. Namely, so that's the, the max, I guess the supremum, because I, um, well, what max is fine for this? Um, uh, the difference of these two functions. So it's something that, say, computationally is a little easier to compute, um, and maybe theoretically a little easier to understand. This is, in some ways, it's harder to compute and maybe a little more refined measure of the difference. Because it takes into account exactly what happens the whole way. Can you say what the side of take conjecture? Is yes. What formally said in terms of these things? Is? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it just says the limit of delta goes to zero. Does that apply all the other things that you'd expect? That like, that I don't know what you would like expect. Statement? Like delta well, delta, delta infinity delta. is bigger than delta c, so okay. bigger than equal to delta c trivially, so yeah. yeah. So, in short, that's the side of the function. <laughs> so you know, you have a, you have a function that you define, and the conjecture which says it goes to zero. Um, if you want to refine the conjecture, you could say maybe try to figure out anything at all about that function besides the fact that it goes to zero in the limit. I mean, functions can have a lot more properties than just going to zero in the limit. Okay. So any questions? Um, again, let me emphasize that. <coughs> One of the main theoretical results of recent times is that, in fact, um, in most cases, this is a theorem. And the key input for that is that, as Mark mentioned in his talk, um, we know a lot now about um, the analytic properties of symmetric power L functions attached to elliptic curves. We don't know that they're modular now, do we? No. no. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For, well, statistics or probability question. Somehow it seems to me that if you have like you know, two distribution, right, two two probability distribution, right? There's, there's this uh, distribution function, right, such that the, you know, the, the probability is measured by the, the integral. Maybe you should actually compare these two distri distribution rather than, than the the probabilities, right? So it's not taking the sort of like the derivatives of this and then taking the L2 norm. Somehow. I don't know, maybe more evenly measures the, uh, the difference on, on, on the entire interval or so? Yeah. I don't know if that, maybe. I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, it makes yeah. sense. I think it makes sense. Mm -hmm. I think it may just be a different thing and harder to yeah. uh -huh. prove it. I think it does make sense. Though. Nonetheless, you can consider this and ask questions. Yeah, sure. But yeah, there's actually, I mean, as you'll see in this talk, the more you do, the more questions there are that I have <laughs> and the more mysterious they seem. So, yes? Is this only for curves over Q? What? Everything in my talk, I'm fixing elliptic curves over Q, but the sada t conjecture um, is, can be used much more generally, for example, modular forms, new forms of higher weight, et cetera, on elliptic curves over Q. No, well, what can be viewed? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. there is a conjecture yeah. in much more generality. The theorem of Taylor, I think, is just relative curves over Q. Well, we get some results over curves really real. Yeah, yeah, really yeah, yeah. One more. Right. Okay, exactly. So come on, okay. on the not modular, you have a, a, a nice little uh, phrase there, actually. You're saying that not that the, that the things are modular. You're saying that the L functions are modular, which you should, of course, the, the, what, what's proved is enough of those L functions um, uh, have meromorphic continuations, mm -hmm. holomorphic to a certain uh, half plane, mm -hmm. so that they behave like modular functions. They behave like the L functions of modular functions. Okay, so yeah. let me rephrase this to C Mark's talk. They are modularish. 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 <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Since you call them L functions, yeah, that's you know, you're, 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 okay, you know, you're okay. Okay. Yeah. You're okay. <laughs> All right, so. Since we want to try to make a conjecture about delta of c, or at least look at delta of c a little more closely than just um, looking at the sada t conjecture, which says that this goes to zero. <coughs> the very natural thing that any calculus student would do would be to um, plot delta of c as a function of c. And what I've done here is I've added <coughs> two things, delta and delta sub infinity of c, which is the L infinity norm. So there are two different functions. Of course, the L infinity norm is bigger, because here you're just taking the biggest difference that you have, whereas here you're taking into account what happens the whole way. So you see that the red line is bigger than the blue one. 
And you see that this is a function that's pretty erratic. Um, but in the limit, it's going down. In fact, it's a theorem that for this particular curve, this is going to eventually get as small as you want. Might um, certainly be unsatisfying because this is only up to 1,000. So let's see what happens if I increase the range. This is up to 10,000. So these are um, sage commands. Sonotate, this is a function that's defined in a notebook on my computer. It's not a command included in sage. <laughs> it should be I write more doc tests. But here's the notebook. And um, you can see here's a class called sonotate, which includes all the calculations. So the functions that I'll call are in this class. And if I write doc test, maybe I'll get to include it in Sage. <laughs> so um, this is the data now up to 10 to the fifth, up to 100,000. And you see that this blue line you know, looks like it's going to zero. Though, you know, if you didn't really know anything, you might think, well, maybe it's not really going to zero. It's just going small, but not. Maybe it doesn't apply to something else. I don't know. Um, but of course, it does go to zero. It's always more exciting to um, have a proof of a conjecture when the data doesn't directly suggest the conjecture is obviously true. Um, this one goes up to a million. And as you can see, this function delta is getting smaller and smaller. I think the statistician would put the x-axis logarithmically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. the y-axis. No, the, well, the, the point of this is to show you the uh, sort of first yeah. naive thing the you can do. And I'm going, to, I'm going to plot in a log okay. sort of manner, but in a not in the most obvious log manner, um, but it'll be a little better than what someone would naively do. So question. I mean, th this is sort of all you really see from if you just need the solid-take injection. You have some functions going down. And down and down. What about the speed of convergence? How does delta C converge to zero? Well, that's the question. So here's a conjecture which um, is due to Akiyama and Tanigawa, which is in MathConf from 1999. And it says the following. Um, it's actually, their conjecture is a bit more refined than what I stated here. So this is just a special case of what we conjecture. For every epsilon greater than zero, and for C sufficiently large, delta C is less than one over square root of C minus epsilon. In other words, basically this function delta C, roughly speaking, it's like one over square root of C which, as you know, goes to zero. Let me put quotes here. 1 over square root of c certainly goes to zero as c goes to infinity. But already a statement like this is much, much more refined than just saying delta goes to zero as c goes to infinity. I mean, you have a function like 1 over c to a much, much, much uh, smaller power than 1 half, and it's still going to zero. So inspired by this conjecture, actually, I didn't know about this conjecture when very suggested looking at the following, but um, for expositional purposes, inspired by this conjecture, let's consider a new function log base c of delta c, or minus that. Now, this is some function that's, that if delta c were equal to 1 over square root of c, this would just be 1 half, right? So let's see how close this function looks to 1 half. So, oh, so oh, you please. Yeah, um, yeah, so minus minus minus. Okay, cool. oh, yeah, I, I can see the minus. Yeah. So there's lots of hands, which is good. Because I don't have lots of slides. Yes, uh, David Parker. So uh, what made them state this conjecture? Like, uh, were they just looking for a statement which would imply the generalized human hypothesis? Well, I, <laughs> no, I don't think so. I mean, here's, a, here's a guess. If you see the Chapitar density yeah. is a baby version of the Did you think yeah. of it? Yes, sort of zero dimensional. Yeah. And in Chapitarov density, that is what you it's the, the, the what you get in the generalizing hypothesis. So, uh, yeah. Okay, no, that's it. So, so, so they're 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 starting with that tradition, I believe. And then they're, yeah. and David, is that conjecture equivalent to GRH? That all. Uh, he um um uh, Akiyama just emailed me saying that he's going to try to prove it. Is it just no, not this conjecture. I think that's a slightly stronger conjecture yeah. that they have, which, um, uh, which is of the, same, of the same ilk. But that stronger conjecture, he wants. He hasn't quite, but he, he believes it. Is the right statement going to be that it, it should be equivalent to GRH for just 
E, or should it also be a, for GRE e, for E and all the symmetric powers? Okay. Well, in their paper, they just do it for E, but in my little expository paper, I just I do it for all symmetric right. powers. And to go the other yeah. way, you would presumably want yeah. all the yeah. 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 symmetric powers. And as Barry just mentioned, there's a paper coming up in the notices, which has a nice discussion. It's Ben's, by the way. Dang, why do I keep That's all right. I continually use that. Okay, uh, more questions about this? Wait, I, I have a question about your comment. You said uh, that Akiyama emailed you and said he was going to try and prove this. Yeah. Is he trying to prove the conjecture or trying to prove that it is, in fact, equivalent to GRH? Oh, so no, 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 he's, he wouldn't bring Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, I just wanted to make sure. No, no, he's just trying to prove the equivalence. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, that's what I thought. I just wanted to confirm this. Slightly stronger list with yeah. Uh, yeah. GRH. That's, that's what I'm saying, so the conjecture is assuming GRH. He's proving the conjecture, if you wish, assuming GRH. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes. I'm not quite yeah. sure of the action. But for you, and, and for my point of view, from my point of view, when I found out about this, I kind of breathed a sigh of relief, because um, no matter what sort of Things I say through the rest of this talk, nobody's going to expect me to prove any of them. So if you replace delta c infinity by just delta c, no. do, you, do you get like uh, some qualitative uh, difference, like strong You'll see. statement? You'll see. Uh, okay. In the limit, there's not really much of a difference. So let's see. So let's test out this uh, conjecture. Um, as if you see a conjecture like this in a paper, it might be good to do some calculations and see if it seems at all reasonable. And as I mentioned over here, what we're going to do is simply plot minus log c of delta c. So we'll get a function which, if it's really close to a half, then delta c is really close to 1 over squared c. Okay. Now let's get within epsilon of a half, actually, from, from the low. And then we can be really brave and start asking questions like, uh, that is, we think of a simple function that nicely approximates this function that we plot. Presumably it's obvious, or at least heuristically obvious, that the exponent can't be better than half? Well, wait until you see the pictures. Okay. Well, presumably that the, those, those elliptic curve L functions have yeah. lots and lots of zeros on the line, on yeah. the central line. Right. Which would present you from getting further. Yeah. I mean, that would, that, that's the reason why we took a car off. That's clearly the right exponent. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of zero. Yeah. Everything is square root cancellation in there. Square root yeah. <laughs> That's the way it goes. So here's the first picture. Um, this picture is, I hope you'll agree, better than just the one, the picture of delta c. And there are two lines here. The green line is minus log c delta c infinity, the L infinity norm. That's this line right here, the bottom one. It's always the bottom one if you're colored blind. Uh, and the blue line is minus log c of delta c. So it's the more refined thing when you take this L2 norm. And by the way, um, computing these in Sage, one key thing is computing a bunch of AP. The second thing, which is kind of interesting, is that we compute this using numerical integration. Um, and in fact, we're using GSL, which the GNU Scientific Library, which is in Sage, and has extremely good um, numerical integration routines that are very flexible. That uh, Josh Cantor, somebody who doesn't do any number theory at all, uh, wrapped for Sage. Spent a lot of time wrapping for Sage. So drawing these sort of pictures. Um, I mean, doesn't Paris do the numerical? Yeah, I thought I thought Henri Co was yeah, very yeah. proud of Paris numerical yeah. integration. The one I've reported by Bob with us in the I think G I mean, my impression is that GSL is far more sophisticated and flexible yeah. and sort of like yeah. some like random function just given by data points. Yeah. Um, Whereas yeah, I think Paris is more aimed at integrating yeah. functions that are analytically yeah, applied that are interested in number theorists. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, plus another thing is speed. I mean, just for, we, what we want is double. Well, we want you know a couple of digits of precision, and we want it quickly. Whereas I think Henri Cohen's routine is incredible because it gets an amazingly large number of digits of precision much more quickly than GSL would get because GSL won't give you anything over double. But it's for explicit functions. Yeah. Uh, but of course, that's that's also a bill. Um, all right, so the red line is one half. That's the, the line in the middle. So what do you see? Well, um, this looks really good. The, the blue thing, the L2 norm, is really just dangling up and down near one half. So basically, 
Um, delta sub c is very, very close to a half um, as you go. Now it doesn't look at all clear from this data that it's going to be closer and closer. Um, but uh, and the green line is actually kind of down here. But according to Akiyama Tanigawa, it's going to eventually get as close as you want. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that. The gray tubular neighborhood, these are error bounds on the integral computed numerically using GSL. So in fact, the blue line is really um, only guaranteed to be within the gray tubular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So okay. here's my question is, why isn't it bouncing all around the side of the plate? the numerical? Well, because yes. the numerical integration is very, I think it's very um, uh, conservative in its error bounds, basically. Huh. It's not, I mean, it's probably a, that these are right. It's just that it gives you back an error bound, which is perhaps much bigger than the actual error. Yes? Is there any reason that there's this positive bias on the left? Like why is it the blue line up above 0.5 so much of the time? I don't know. I don't know. Very much the same. Okay. Uh, great. So, just roughly, how long did it take to compute all the data for that picture? That's a great question. Um, computing the AP up to 10 to the 6 takes, I don't know, about 8 or 9, 10, you know, something like, depends on the computer, but under 10 seconds on my laptop. Um, then, drawing the additional graph takes about the same amount of time. Okay. I mean, so, <laughs> so, I mean, if you wanted to, you could very easily, like on Sage Math, Extend this to ten to the seven. I will. I will make a remark about that at the end of the talk. But since you asked me, to, well, I'll make a remark about that at the end of the okay, talk, that's cool. um, which will be more, much more detailed. Okay. So, yes, it will be good to extend this much further. Okay. So, um, thirty-seven a, three d nine a. You notice here it's a little different. Um, a difference here is, of course, there are more zeros, so the L function really low. Because 3D90 has analytic ring two, so it's a double zero. And it's below. And you might, I mean, if you're really naive, you might think maybe this blue line just wiggles around here and never gets up close to the red line. But I'm definitely, I'm going to conjecture that it, as you'll see, um, that it certainly does in a fairly precise way. Continuing, here's um, the first curve of rank three, and it gets pushed down a little more. But again, um, the conjecture is just go up to a half. And there's no actual proof that it can stay below half forever? There can't be what? Sorry, say it again? Oh, I'm sorry, it's below half. It's not a matter of being above the line. Sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Going even further, here's um, the first known rank 4 curve. And the first uh, rank 4 curve of uh, modern action. There's no prime conductor curve that's smaller. Yeah, exactly. Um, so here, it's actually a little lower yet. But the picture looks roughly the same, but a little lower. Yeah, but it's not, I mean, these pictures are not completely convincing that it's actually going get, to get to a half. You certainly need more data. <laughs> Absolutely. And in fact, that's what I want to convey to you right now, is it's not at all convincing that this sort of conjecture may, I mean, a, a conjecture that in the limit, this is basically what we're going to see. So such a brief conjecture should be true. Yeah, it's not right, completely right. obvious from the data. In fact, the data almost, well, certainly for a while, would convince me hmm. completely the opposite. Again, this sort of tension. So does that does that suggest that it's more like one of those C to the point four or something? <laughs> <laughs> some yeah. So there's a there's a zero of a some some function off the line. Is, is there a single formula or that you can exhibit the zeros or something? I mean, or is this the, when you talk about zeros, is that heuristic or is it based on, on actual? What do you mean zeros no, of the no, function? It, 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 it is heuristic. Yeah, it's heuristic. Yeah. Oh, so, I mean, yeah. presumably you can hope yeah. for some sort of asymptotic expansion for this. You right? can hope for it, but it's not. But, the f but uh, if, you, if you think about it, the, the format is different from the explicit formulas, yes. it seems. I mean, quite different. But it'd be great to have an asymptotic form. Um, a curve of break 5, a little farther down. Yeah. Uh, a curve of break 6. Maybe it's curved around 6, 7, 8 and something happened? 
I think Tom Womack's web page or something. Ah. Yeah. I think this is in our paper. Or maybe it's funny, but the seven and eight one might sound different. Okay. A ranked seven curve. <laughs> oh, my I mean, does that really go that's, up there? <laughs> that's disturbing. <laughs> <Looks like it. laughs> but you know, it's really weird. I, I'm going to convince you within a half hour that this definitely goes up. Well, I already believe the theoretical. I, you I already believe the conjecture on the theoretical grounds. Data, but not believing the conjecture. Um, okay, rank eight. Um, no, what more slides have you got? No, i here. Rank 28. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's terrible. <laughs> but I mean, by the way, think about it. The, the plot I'm drawing, it doesn't, I mean, the complexity doesn't depend on the conductor. Which is kind of interesting because uh, you get some feeling for something about the rank of the curve doing a calculation whose complexity doesn't depend on the conductor. Or maybe you don't, I don't know. I mean, you get some feeling about the low-light mm -hmm. zero zones. Oh, okay. So now I have a question. Yes. Did you try drawing the same plots for fixed rank, but oh, yeah. varying the conductor and see what happens? I'll show you. I did, and in fact, <laughs> interesting things. I mean, it's really, the, I think it's more the low line zeros rather than the rank. Okay. I mean, the main reason I'm choosing curves with large rank is just to get a bunch of zeros for you. Yeah. So um, did you try a curve with a low line zero? That is not? Well, I'll show you some data in a second. So, yeah. So, if, I mean, but the big question right now is, are they really going to have? And the main point here is I've exhibited a bunch of examples where it's not obvious that they, they are from the data. So, and, and another just basic question that I think is very interesting is, um, given these, this, you know, that now that you've defined this function delta, is there some way to predict, in some sense, its behavior, not just in the limit, say, going to one half, but its actual actual structure in terms of something involving the arithmetic? of the elliptic curve. Probably not, but maybe at least involving the zeros of the L function of the curve. But I don't know. We shall see. OK, so now here's, here's um, an observation. We take this, here's another example of a rank zero curve, but I actually, it's a random curve in the sense that I just type some random digits on the keyboard. It's the only sense in which it's random. So you can see there's one, two, three, four, so maybe I'm not that good at a <laughs> random number generator. <laughs> but, uh, there's a blue, a green line. Like before, notice things are shifted down. So it's certainly not the case that if the curve has rank one, it's going to be really close to it. Right. Oh, this is zero. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, same, yeah, this is rank zero. Same, with rank, same statement applies to rank one. You can easily find rank one curves where it's down farther. Um, so by the way, I drew a black curve here, which I, I don't know. In this example, it's not so clear that it's fitting the data that well. But I'll show you some other examples where it seems much more evident. And the curve I've drawn is simply 1 half minus 1 over log x, which is a function that converges to 0 very slowly. Minus just two one half. Hmm? No, no, no. The function oh, 1 over log x. I'm sorry. I oh, didn't right. say which, which I was thinking of. The function 1 over log x converges to 0 very slowly, and therefore 1 half minus 1 over log x converges to 1 half very slowly. Okay. By the way, this curve, the random curve I chose has this big conductor. So the two observations to make here are first, um, maybe there's maybe, maybe there's some relationship between a half minus a constant over log x and the graphs of the blue and green lines. Um, second, maybe there's some maybe we shouldn't be looking at the rank so much as the low line zeros or something some other quantity attached to the curve. So just to give you a little more information about the zeros for the curve eleven a where delta was really close to 1 half, these are the first 10 zeros of the L function, at least the imaginary parts of them. And notice they're pretty high. And this, for the curve that I just considered, are the first 10 zeros. And when you have 10 of them before you have the first zero of the other L function. We have a phage question. Will Please. you do that? Does that mean that phage has already pre-computed the table of zeros you're just extracting? No, 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 no. Mark, I'm uh, sorry, Mike Rubenstein uh, wrote a program, LCALC, which is capable of computing the zeros of uh, any zeta or L function, or at least a lot of different zeta or L functions in the critical strip rigorously. And it's running that program. Uh -huh. So this was computed on the fly, and it takes, for uh, this curve, it's almost, it's very, very fast. For this curve, because the conductor is really large, it takes like a minute or something. So you have to feed his program some of the APs? Yes. No. The 
I don't think so. I think it. Um, or I mean, but no. it, it somehow uses those. I, you, it's a command line program. I think you give it the elliptic curve as input. It computes the APs. Oh, it's computing them itself. I believe it calls Perry. Okay. It Perry but Mark says no, so maybe. Or, well, the reason I was asking is I want to know how many APs it uses to get ten zeros. I think it chooses. Yeah. Uh, square root of the conductor. Square root of the conductor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it, it it does grow with the conductor yeah. significantly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay, good, excellent. So LCALC uses Perry for various things, such as the uh, EAP. Okay. Uh, yeah, Is that the last slide? No. There are many interesting slides. It says to return to your computer, plus press Control Command. Oh, that's to get a VMware, I see. Yeah, maybe to I think I'm sure he has this talk pre recorded on that. I do have the talk on the wiki page and I can just download the PDF and do it under S10. Oh. Well, then we can all just look at it ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, you put it up already. Why are you doing this in VMware anyway? Because I prefer Linux. For showing a PDF? For anything. Linux. I didn't <laughs> The way you have an idea. Virtual machines? VMware is not so good though. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't care about it. I think VMware does a terrible job with resource management. Yeah, operating. Whatever the operating Kernels system is involved, so not VM. Why aren't you using Kernel? It's clearly better for showing a PDF on the screen. Kernels doesn't support 64 bit guest OSs. Oh. Which is, I just switched to using uh, VMware recently to see why this, and it has Kernels. pros and cons. But I think that ceasing to work in the middle of the presentation is a significant con. <laughs> 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 You're hugging the bad boy. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm done downloading it. Oh, I've just got it locally now. No, no, it's the end of the talk. Oh, it's back. There you oh, go. You've seen everything. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So this is exactly the same as what I did before, but I took that first rank three curve, where some of the data is a little cleaner. Here's the blue and green lines, which kind of don't look like they're ever going to go up to the red line, and here's the black line, which. Um, it's one half yeah. minus, I wrote the as blue three or three. does not meet the red line. Log outs. And it kind of looks like the black line may be yeah. a reasonable approximation for the blue line. But the black line also does go up to the red line eventually. So I'm sorry. What's the? Yeah, I got the T in. Yeah, which T line is the black one? Yeah. <laughs> it's when you, it's, it's a theoretical T line. Yeah, the the That's correct. They get so, close, but they don't meet. Yeah. So <laughs> let's look at another example, the rank four curve that we considered before. We have the blue line, the green line, and interestingly, one half minus four thirds is over log x. If I draw that, it looks like a pretty good fit to the, the blue and green lines. And as you can tell, it certainly goes to one half eventually. And here's, a, here's the rank eight curve that we were considering. And I put one half minus this. I played around with a bunch of fractions, and this one seems to be the best one. Um, I haven't had time to write a program that computes um, as a function of this constant that I put here, say the L2 norm of the difference of the black line and the blue line, and then plots that, but I will do that soon. But I mean, you're, you're only fitting against curves that go to 1 half, so why yeah. is that supposed to convince me that <laughs> you're only giving me options that tend yeah. to 1 half, so why is that supposed to convince me that the curve tends to 1 half? I mean, if you do it 
Yeah, it should have a two parameter. You should have like you another should parameter. Have a minus b over log x yeah. and do a double fit. And if, a is very, so and if you get a extremely oh. close to one half, then I'll be convinced. Sorry to not convince you. This convinces me though. <laughs> Here's the rank 28 curve. <laughs> so interestingly, um, if you draw the rank 28 curve and you consider the graph of the function one half minus 28 over 9 log x, you have the blue curve, the green curve, and this graph. And they kind of look similar, don't they? So yes, you 3 before. Yep. And 9 now. Any idea? And it's, all, it's certainly not just a function of the rank. Um, but it's something involving the service. But no, I don't know. Yeah. It's very mysterious because if you change this to 29 or 27, it doesn't look that close. Why does it have to be rational? Yeah. It doesn't. I'm just giving you some pictures. Yeah. Well, no, it'll just be way off. My primary goal with drawing these pictures was to simply get you to want to ask questions. <laughs> um, David. So, when you say changing the 28 over 9 at all, yeah, well, well, what I, I mean, sorry, changing, by the, similar changing the numerator, small, changing the numerator, obviously, changing it at all, that's a, that would be a ridiculous statement. <laughs> but if you change it to 27 or 29, yeah, make sure with the log, with, with the base being the log as uh, Mark suggested, like the x-axis. Yeah, the x-axis being the log. Mm -hmm. What? You don't have a picture where the x-axis is in uh, log. Yeah. Yeah. No. That would be kind of helpful. Then it would be one over x. Oh, yeah. If you don't have a connection between these rational numbers and the curve, we might as well put a uh, real number. Yeah. Well, yeah. It may be a real number. It may be yeah, some. I'm just right. I'm showing you some a picture. That's all. <laughs> I mean, I'm not I'm not making a definition. Maybe some yeah. function of the yeah. lowest, yeah. lowest yeah. zero. I'm just showing you a picture that is yeah. kind of surprising. Yeah, <laughs> that's all. That's all I'm doing. And that would make yeah, it would make sense so, for it to be some function of the lowest yeah. zero. Yeah. <laughs> now skip to this. So, how about let's define. Let's, if you really want to, um, for an elliptic curve. And a specific choice of C, so you have one specific picture. And I don't know if this definition makes sense yet, because I just made it an hour and a half ago. But uh, uh, it might make sense. For a specific C, specific cutoff, a constant, which is the best possible choice as a real number, um, so that the L2 norm is minimized of the difference between this function delta and one half minus k over c log c. So you could plot as a function of, you could plot this L2 norm, the L2 norm of the difference of the two functions we're considering. Here, you could just vary this parameter and plot it, and you would see something that probably looks like this. And then over the maxis, that's the definition of this number k of c. It's a function of actually a I don't know whether or not it exists. And assuming it exists, I don't know whether or not this limit exists. But if this does exist, you can consider the limit as c goes to infinity of all these constants. And that's a number attached to the elliptic curve. Wait, so actually, going back, if you Makes were, no sense. If we simplify the picture a bit, like you're, you're looking at log c delta c. Um, if you just look at log uh, delta c and not normalize it with dividing by log c, what you're saying is that it seems like the answer is going to be something like log c over 2 minus some constant, which seems almost as good as what you're conjecturing. Um, like plus, you plus that what I'm conjecturing is almost as good as what I'm conjecturing. No, 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 no I'm, saying, I'm saying that there's a better way of breaking down what you're uh, sort of you know, saying, which I think is, might be a bit better, um, which is instead of looking at log c over delta, uh, over log delta c over log c, why don't you just look at log delta yeah. c? I mean, and then you're, you're factoring out only pairs in one term, so two. And then you're like one possible conjecture that you're getting a polynomial in terms of log c. I yeah. like just multiply that through by log c. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. There's no log x. There's no log x anywhere in the picture. Except the x-axis, which I've inclined c throughout. Is that a case? Uh, maybe somewhere else I wrote x. Or, wait, what do you think of x as? Okay, great. I may have actually accidentally written that somewhere. 
Um, Anyways, don't, don't worry about that comment. I'll talk to you later. My only defense is this is this perspective is exactly what Eric suggested. <laughs> 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 I actually, I suggested more. I suggested more curves. I mean, for yeah, example, no, no, that's later on. Several uh, months ago. Actually. Oh, oh, yeah. From the, I mean, from the beginning, it really. Yeah, I, yeah, I, 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 I like the one half for yeah. some reason. I like the one half. I also um, I, I, yeah. uh, But of course, you know, if you exponentiate it, let us say all of these are in the exponent, the one half. Sure. Sam. Ah, go, go <laughs> ahead. Uh, yeah, there, there. I like that formula, that blue formula. Is it blue or purple? Yep. Bluish. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Gary, you can <laughs> Well just uh, just you see what we what what you yeah. The general if you think of the random matrix people, when they try to uh, uh, curve fit, they have three parameters, really. A constant A, a power of log Z, and the, power the, the actual power of X, C. And of course, this is just a kind of curve fitting sort of thing. And um, uh, if, you, if you think of what's going to happen, uh, especially for your data, the C equals a half is clearly a good, a good bet. The A and the B up for grabs at the moment, and that's the challenge to try to figure out whether first there is an A and a B, whether they depend upon uh, low-lying zeros, or um, uh, as, as was suggested, maybe there's some sort of asymptotic formula. But the C is one half, I think, both of us right. are, I think that are convinced. Sarish is in a sense saying he isn't. The A and B, we're not, we're not convinced. You know, we're sure. I would think that A should be 1 over B and not B, but that's just a minor takeaway. No, I, I'm not saying that I'm not convinced. I just think that there's a slightly better plot that might give a better idea of what it just should be. But I'll talk to you about it later. Sure. I mean, my experience of this so far is that every single time I look at the data, there's like 10 different things that are nicer that you can do. That's true. And more. It's really open-ended. That's good. That's good enough research as well. Um, so this is something, so I mean, the next thing to look at is more general possible forms. But of course, there are infinitely many different shapes of how you can fit some data. But I, I like this a lot because it fits in well with what, what we're observing. And again, I think this is, there's something to me at least very compelling about this. It certainly makes me think that the blue and green lines do go to one half of the limit. I don't know about you, maybe not Huron, but personally. <laughs> what happens if you find a similar curve with 0.45 and even better bits? Similar curve with, with what? Right, if, if you allow the half to vary. One half to vary. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean. So I still understand. You haven't tried yet to vary the parameter one half there. So right. Yeah, yeah, that, was that was my original complaint. Start out in the, mm -hmm. you can see there could be an even better fit if it's 0.47 or something. Mm -hmm. Maybe this sort of fit will occur in my talk later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you want to start this here. And it's numerically very unstable. I yeah, so. I, I don't. I mean, so again, the secondary term, so. again, the, um, so, so ju I mean, just to emphasize that the sort of jumping off point for all of this is this conjecture of Akiyama Tanagawa, which is very likely equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis. Hence, it's very likely true that it goes to a half. And the thing I'm invested, I mean, really what I want to understand is how it goes to one half. And I think this is starting to give a sense of how it goes to a half. It's something like one of the kind of constant over log. Okay, so that's I mean it's somehow that you're getting something that goes to one half isn't really the question. It's how it goes to one half. So you're right. I'm presupposing that, but primarily because it's um, true. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this definition may or may not be a good one. Um, some other things to do, and I'm almost done with my talk now. One thing you could do is instead of integrating from minus one to one and so on, you can restrict to little subintervals, and you have a distribution there. And you can ask whether the same sorts of things happen. So 
very natural thing to do. Uh, I was actually going to ask something related okay. to this. Okay. So uh, when you measure this function x of t, why don't you take the integral from minus t to t and then let t go to 1? Yeah. So why don't you? It's like a bit more symmetric. So what happens? Why don't I? Because Barry told me to do this. No, 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 um, that's the finite interval for minus one to one. So you can you can uh, encode a lot of different questions like that in terms of their conjunction. Wait, I, I don't think I understand your question because okay. it sounds to me that you get exactly the same. Like the functions are just going to be well, shifted. Your point is you, you start from zero from the uh, yeah yeah, from, and, and that's just going to be a constant. By by additivity and integrals, that's just going to be plus or minus a constant. So you're just shifting the two functions by some value, and when you're looking at the differences, those are cast like. Cancel out in the limit, I guess. No, no, no. no he's 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 look at the data AP over 2 squared T. And he is computing the data in this big interval. Uh -huh. Suppose you chose another interval. You replace the minus 1 by some number and the T by some other number. Okay. Then you're computing the data in that oh, smaller so sorry, interval. It's asking for what happens if you look yeah. at it at a smaller, okay. smaller interval. And okay. then you, you, you make the, the interval, the x of T, t suit to suit. But, but if, if you were going to go for like the symmetric one, as yeah. my understanding was, going from minus t to t, mm -hmm. that's the same thing as replacing the top one with, oh, I see. So those are not exactly no, the not same. Exactly. Okay. By, by the way, we did do a lot, of, um, a lot of computations where we replaced minus 1 to 1 with all kinds of different sorts of subintervals. And nothing really looks any different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. Well, I'm sure. Although, yeah, that's I mean, in a, in a very, in I guess, qualitative sense, these don't. Maybe trying to quantitate exactly how fast convergence goes. Depends. I think it's actually a lot faster than it goes to one half when you choose a small interval, if I remember correctly. So the very last thing I want to mention is that um, it would be nice to push the calculations a bit further instead of going up to, say, a million. But, I mean, I've almost never gone beyond, say, 10 million in doing these. Uh, every calculation I just showed you, the entire thing, I did all of those uh, almost all of those this morning in my hotel room on my laptop. So that tells you about the amount of time it takes for the ones I've shown you. Um, it, would nice, it would be nice to push them up to 10 to the 9th, say, or 10 to the 8th. You know, wait a couple of hours maybe for the whole thing. Or, as it turns out, maybe not so long. Um, Drew, who's right there, who's a postdoc at MIT, has um, just surprised me by, um, he has some C code. I mean, C code. That, uh, <laughs> not italics. <laughs> quite a lot of C code, actually, that computes the APN elliptic curve and some of the similar calculations on Jacobian, for Jacobians of hyperelliptic curves. And it's extraordinarily fast. Moreover, it's multi threaded. So you drop this program, he drops this program on stage.math, builds it, and um, it's pretty impressive. So, one benchmark that he did yesterday, um, which I'll be a little vague about it, because he didn't exactly do that benchmark, it's slightly harder. Oh, you um, or actually, you can talk. It's your slide. I'll just down before you. you can take it off to, uh, <laughs> probably can. This would be great. This is a long I mean, the long and short of it is it's just freaking fast. Curso's SSH through SSH. So is getting up to 10 to the ninth going to make Kiran convinced that? <laughs> <laughs> or is it just going to be uh, one of these? Well, things? doing that and yeah, fitting yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and yeah. doing a curve fit where you vary the parameter yeah. one half. Yeah. Or yeah. proving that GRH implies this. <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, yeah, that already, that already yeah. I would. This, wait, just, just to, just, while he's doing this, the quick thing is basically his code um, in single threaded mode is at least twice as fast as Magma and Harry at this, and he can run it at 16 cores at once. So you get 30, over 30 times faster than anything I have access to right now. So wow. pick a curve, AX plus B, I just need to know. That doesn't really matter. What are the logic It's still going to go closer. Yeah. And, yeah. yes, yeah. question. I mean, it's like yeah. 9, 6, yeah. nine, six yeah. to yeah. Yeah. It's, in its No, but it gives you more. I mean, does it mean you need shared memory? Yeah. You get no, more. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. That's what the problem is. That's the problem. Is it more you data should get a parallel. Just run 16 copies of Magma and take everything. Yeah. 
compiled it yesterday, so it's yeah, they're it's not the plugged with right. And this could be done over a network. Uh, there's no reason they yeah, don't have to actually right. be shared. Oh, is that like an uh, MPI program? What is it? Is it a C program? So right now it's a C program using pipes. It should cool. be switched well, to a program it? that uses sockets, in which case it could just as easily run distributed. Oh, right. Oh, oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, right. Oh, right. So there's how many? That's how many primes. The progress report. So we're going up to. So it's the speed increase here due to. So this should, depending on what other people are doing right now, should take too long. There we go. There you go. So 40 is the Wow. So I took really sort of maybe a different way of uh, testing conversions. These are the moments of the um, of A1 or AP. Um, so you know the expected value is one. Then the, so if, as according to the set of tape, we would expect these the odd moments should be zero, and then the uh, even moments should be Cadillac numbers one, two, five, uh, 14, 42, 132, and if you look at this, sort of doing the same idea of gradually increasing the number of primes you're going to, you can also look at how these odd moments go to zero, and you see a pretty nice smooth descent. That, by the way, that's, an, uh, that's another good way to measure the, yeah. the rate of convergence, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. to measure the convergence of the moments. And then there's also a... That's in some sense how you prove. Yes. It's not okay, <laughs> right? It's <laughs> proving the convergence of the moments. Moments are equivalent to distribution. <laughs> So this is a genus two curve, and so you can take sort of the the generalization of solitude is a random symplectic matrix model, and you can also predict again with the and does this have a generic automorphism group? Um, you have to worry about that. Mm -hmm. that that's the same nonce yeah, essentially. Remember we're talking yeah. to Tim Dutcher at a conference, and he wrote this program for computing null series of anything basically, and he. He put it in the and then really wanted to use it to compute all series of Jacobians of genus 2 curves. But then he was really frustrated because he couldn't compute very many terms of the all series of the genus 2 curve quickly enough to do anything interesting. Maybe that's not the case anymore. Yeah, so this is. Uh, yeah, so it's not the same. So this was two all primes up to a million for genus 2 curve. And here's the one moments. And again, we should ex this to go, I think, 1, 3, 4, 2, 3, 4, I don't know what that coefficient is, but I don't know. And then there's other thing, we can also look at the A2 moments. And in genus 3, um, there's another advantage of using moments, and trying to get past genus 1 or maybe 2, you can't really compute the, the distribution very well, right? the moments you can always find. Yeah, yeah, the, the moments yeah, are kind of nice. The distribution is kind of a pain. Like this was actually Kieran's suggestion to look at the higher moments, and, and there's some uh, interesting commentaries involved. Uh, it should also be A1, A2 moments. Yeah, so I have both the A1 and the A2 moments. And actually, it's slightly better than the A1, A2 moments are the, are the power sum moments. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those, those, have nice, those have nicer combinatorics. The A1 to the I, A2 to the J, whatever. Right, but it's, it, you, want, you want S1 to the I, S2 to the J. Right, those, even those, yeah, are, yeah. those are slightly better. Right? Yeah, it's the same data, but the, it's slightly easier to, to describe this, the power sum though, it's I think. Oh, um, there's a singularity of 2347. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh well. Is this a point of bad reduction? Presumably. Yeah, it's bad reduction. Well, you just ignore that. Yeah, it should. It's, sure. it's going to be some of them somewhere. Yeah, so one minute. One minute. Um, well, probably so this. in genus one, it's pretty straightforward. It's just uh, baby step, giant steps. Um, you know, maybe the only thing that is clever that makes it particularly fast is using a parallel version of the baby steps, giant steps algorithm. By parallel, I mean you doing the group operations in parallel. 
So if you use a, an affine representation for the elliptic curve group law and use uh, Montgomery um, trip to do inver field inversions in parallel, um, you can do you get about a 3x speed up in the group operation. So just doing the um, Faster. By that I mean if you, rather than doing a baby steps, giant steps, where you're computing sort of each baby step and giant step separately, if you can arrange it to sort of have like a bunch of babies and a bunch of giants marching in parallel, it's faster. And then the other thing that makes it, so that's in genus one. In genus two and three, it's a lot more interesting because you're not just, um, you need to compute, you know, all of the coefficients of the L polynomial. So in, in genus two, I was kind of surprised that actually counting points over the um, the fastest thing to do there is to count points to get A1 and then do baby giant steps to get A2, which is kind of surprising because the doing baby steps, giant steps over the whole interval would be sort of an O of P to the three fourths, and counting points over <coughs> FP is O of P, but counting points over FP can be done really fast, and so for primes less than about three million, I found it faster to do that and then do baby steps, giant steps. And then the genus 3 one was, is sort of the most challenging because there's the, the most cases involved. But it's interesting in genus 3, it's always better, it's always worth first counting um, points over FP and then doing baby steps, giant steps, because the, the point counting is O of P and then you've got an O of P problem left on the group operations. Um, and then the only other thing maybe worth mentioning, I don't have a slide, but you get very nice pictures if you plot. Um, so this is my low tech. <laughs> Windows one. Why? Uh, so uh, this is the curve that uh, you've already seen for genus one, just semicircular. But then um, this is the curve for genus two. That's the A one. So this is A one in genus two. Is this one here? And then. This is A1, let's uh, This is A1 in genus 3. So they start to get a lot more concentrated. And then the other interesting thing, the only reason I mentioned this in terms, because it has an impact on performance, I thought this was kind of an interesting exercise because I was sort of you know, writing this program so that we could look at um, patterns in the data. And then one pattern I found is that um, the distribution of A2 is kind of interesting. You can't really see it real great in this picture, but you'll notice it's not symmetric. And in fact, um, in genus three, A2 can't be less than negative. The, 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 when I say A2, I mean A2 normalized over P can't actually be less than negative one. And its expected value is one, and it tends to be clustered around there. Knowing that fact actually sped up the algorithm by a factor of three, because now it knows where to start before, it was either you know two approaches would be start at the beginning of the wheel interval and search forward, or start at the center of the center. But if you know something about the distribution, you can optimize the search to start at the best place in the distribution. So that was that was a big improvement. Well, yeah. So you showed me the other day the um, the, some combinatorial interpretations of the moments for these kind of genus cases. Can you go from that to write, writing down some simple closed formula for the what the, what the curve looks like? Like instead, so of a semi, for, instead of a semicircle, you'll have those other shapes. Is there any nice formula for that? Yeah. Um, so, is it okay if I erase? Yep. Um, so, sort of the analog of this integral is um, this is in Katz and Sarnak. Uh, so, yeah. So if we 
represent the, so this is sort of the random matrix hypothesis. Um, so these uh, theta i's So if your curve has um, characteristic polynomial whose roots are theta i minus theta i, I goes from 1 to g, and we choose the theta i to all be between 0 and pi. Um, so in uh, when g is 1, you wind up with um, just um, that. And when g is 2, you're going to get some this I think you have two or five here. This two you can get something like this. Cn is the nth catalan number. Um, something like this. And this can actually be viewed as a generalization. If you think of the catalan numbers as walks on a uh, one dimensional real line that just that have to stay to the right of the origin and can go forward or backwards and have to end up back at zero. So that would be one definition of the catalan numbers. In two dimensions, you could generalize that to a dike path where you have to stay within this chamber so that the, uh, the x1 coordinate is always bigger than the x2 coordinate. You look at random walk, or, you know, walks that return to the origin. This counts those walks. And in general, so in, um, for genus 3, it's not quite a simple closed form, but again, you can work through this integral and find that there are formulas known for counting the combinatorial formulas known for counting the walks inside the chamber. Uh, the wild chamber, and I've checked that those certainly match in genus 2, 3, and numerically in genus 4, 5, etc. They seem to all match. Okay, so should we, should we thank our speakers? Are there any other questions? So, one thing you never mentioned is that. Um, for a rank R curve, the A sub P should be on average negative R, not zero. I mean, this follows from BSD and the Euler product, just fixing a big zero. I mean, this will get swamped when you divide out yeah. R, R, R over twice the square root of P. But could that be a manifestation of why you, on why in your first slides you saw everything shift? Yeah, yeah definitely. Right, that might, yeah, that maybe that would give you a, a better curve fit if you accounted for, I mean, slightly better curve fit on the small depth. The small end. Yeah. Pick up that. That's true. That's true. Yes. Yeah, so um, you get this if you, uh, when you prove the subject conjecture, you, you do it by some estimates of some uh, pile sums. If you know uh, a better, if you know the error term in these estimates, does it tell us anything about the error term in the, in the subject? Or, uh, Oh, yeah, that, You're asking me. I was going to ask that same question. <laughs> Does anybody know the answer? Well, in some, in, if you formulate what you, what you want to know about those, well, some very 
to say precisely. That you actually get something very close to the uh, conjecture that the two Japanese So if you say anyone tried to do this, well, uh, numerically, I think uh, William has. Have you looked at the have, have, sort of so the, so the point is you pick some some non-trivial character of SU two yes. and then you you yeah. sort of you sum over the consciousness classes that you're right. getting exactly. and I mean, yeah so yeah. do we know but what the numbers look like for those well now, now, you, now you're getting to uh, the way uh, the Japanese paper formulated I mean it's really right. they take an arbitrary function mm -hmm. um, okay. from, uh, a function on the in interval, and they either integrate it uh, over the integral, or they sort of integrate it by taking averages of values of that function on the data. Yeah. And um, uh, and of course the the question is how you know how how close are those bounds? Um, if you look in their paper, there are some uh, L infinity bound hmm. pictures. But I think William has been essentially doing this just for a uh, specific uh, characteristic function. Right. Just for characteristic functions. Graham, could you put up the last slide? They went back from the bottom to the The very last slide? Yeah. Just sure. So these are just some timings. So um, magma is not my fastest code. In Sage and Magma, I can carry Magma, computing the AP up to 10 to the 7 takes that amount of time, 94 seconds and 81 seconds. And uh, Mark actually wrote this. When I, um, I, I visited Sydney, I think the third time, but every time I visited there, I you know, begged John Cannon to make the traces of Frobenius command anything but glacially slow, because it slowed down everything I wanted to do. And I told him he needed to hire uh, Mark for a while to do it, and he did. Right. First they answer, did, uh, they first, fast. first they did a linear algorithm, then they, then they implemented steps, but not baby steps, giant steps. <laughs> and then finally, I got baby steps, giant steps. Right. I, what was it before? Because it was so amazing. So well, it was using Chronicler. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but these are, all, these are both running single-threaded, right? I mean, yes, yeah. they're both single-threaded. So. And well, so I think you guys did some comparisons yeah. yesterday or the day before or something. Um, where you assumed you, you, you ran your single thread and it was still two or three times faster. Mm -hmm. Right, Drew? Yeah. And actually, but Mark made a good suggestion that mm -hmm. I think would help speed up my code a bit for well, small So, small uh, when you get big enough, um, so I just find, I search, I start in the center of the interval and I look for the first exponent um, of the, uh, I pick a, pick a random group element and I'm searching the real interval for uh, an exponent of that group element. And I find the first one, and then I actually have to factor that number to verify, to actually compute the order of the group element. And Mark's suggestion was, why bother doing that? Search the whole interval, and if there's only one exponent, you're done. And if there's two, two. you can take their difference, and you've got a much smaller number to deal with. When it gets big enough, yeah, it's I not worth doing that. But for small ones, I think it would speed up the code a bit. So yeah, these are the times. By the way, just to occur to me, so something that's sort of unrelated, but um, I've been looking a lot at Fourier coefficients of, de of modular forms of weight to level n defined over a quadratic field and looking at how many are integers. And um, the data makes it very clear, and some heuristics make it very clear that you should conjecture they're infinitely many. And this is somehow an analog of Nome's theorem that they're infinitely many AP that are zero for an elliptic curve. And um, the calculations I've been doing so far are just using modular symbols. So it actually takes quite a while to go up to even 10,000. So using your program might um, be really good. You could take a genus 2 curve whose Jacobian is modular and use your program to compute the Fourier coefficients a sub p much farther and get more precise data about how many AP are integers instead of uh, algebraic integers. They're actually rational integers. So is the so idle system that. there, is that a, an idle sage.math? Yeah, it was pretty yeah. Last Does that time. exist? Like that would exist. <laughs> it took about eight and a half minutes when I ran it last year. Yeah. That's not so, right now it's only, it's yeah, probably a bit faster. Right? Tell us if you do it. Plus I can always green nice everybody else. Something that takes 7.8 gigabytes. I can set your priority <laughs> um, and green nice everybody else to be 19. Somebody else is closing 22 uh, gigabytes. Oh Which one? Oh. Are oh, those prices? Yeah. 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 The two GPs that you said those were running off the notebook and the changes. Yeah, just no, this is yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean it did not. Oh, you can do that within time. Yeah. 
Are there any other questions? Yeah. Oh, you can yeah. Um, how much communication over is involved in between the different drafts? It's not that. The one change I made when I, because um, it was originally just using Stream.io for each prime, the change I made uh, for when I ported it yesterday to, to run on stage was to just do it in blocks of like, you know, it sends a, 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 a the parent thread spawns off, you know, eight or 16 or whatever child threads and says, and then there's only one enumeration of primes, and then it sends packages of like a thousand primes in one datagram and says, here's a thousand primes, send you back a datagram that has the AP values for those thousand primes. So pretty much it's linear with the number of CPUs. It's embarrassing. Yeah. 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 So yeah. We, once, once you're there, Wait, did you have something? Did you call it something else at the MSR? Oh, okay. Probably parallelizable. That's what I'm going to <laughs> yeah, it's linear. Yeah, sorry, yeah, I ran, it was linear up to 8, and then once I got past 8, it stopped being so, from 8 to 16, it wasn't so linear, but then I realized that was because there were other people yeah. using the computer. Um, what about sending the group operations in parallel also? How do you do that? I mean, that's not um, a Yeah, so first the, the group operations in maybe maybe at once is a better word than in parallel. It's yeah. the, the key is that you only have, you can combine field inversions in uh, you know, as a big batch of yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is just Montgomery's trick. Yeah. So I didn't yeah. find you that much, but then I... You know, well, it, 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 yeah. I think the, tr the thing is a lot of times it's not used because you know, like you're just exponentiating one element. It's hard yeah. to get a lot of the ones to happen in batches. But with baby steps, giant steps, yeah. it's doing like 64 steps yeah. in parallel. One. So like basically the baby steps, giant steps algorithm in Genius 1 is like two steps, but each step is like 32 parallel operations. Have you ever done MPI coding? No, because I think with, with loads or whatever, that would be like, just throw a couple of the notes at the problem. What's NPI? Message passing interface, which is like, um, if you have, if you have, if you have, li if you have li uh, little communication between the different sub-processes, you just spawn a process on yeah. the remote node, and then get back the result, and I think the code uh, is, is very, uh, should work very well with that kind of model because now in um, on Sage Map we have, we have a, a CC NUMA SMP style system. I mean, uh, and uh, you can't really go past 16 or 32 cores. Yeah. I mean, there's but it doesn't need the shared memory, so there's no reason not to. You're right, and on a distributed network, you can do yeah, that. If you're, if you're interested, I can do that kind of stuff. Okay, yeah, let's talk. But have, it, have it run on something like 1600 persistent or something like that? Well, the Lone Star just mentioned something yeah. that Fernando's giving certain people accounts on. And it has 5,500 processors. Oh, okay. And they're all 2.66 gigahertz Xeons. Ooh. And it has a very nice uh, Linux install. It's a very sweet machine. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, just thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks to everyone again. Two, two talks. <laughs> William, what time do we want to start the, uh, the wrap up? Uh, I don't know. Remember? Uh, after lunch. Maybe 1.30? Yeah, 1.30. What's time? What's time? Um, so we can yeah, go 1.30. It's right. a bit fast. It's like it's like at 3. Yeah. Four yeah. Four yeah. Yeah. It's supposed to be yeah. 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 six. Yeah, I mean, how much? Well, in fact, yeah. it's even better than that because he's saying for the first 2,000 times, he gets a point for so Yeah, so yeah. Size, yeah. Which is keep this moving. Well, but yeah, we haven't hit basically, we haven't hit clock I mean, certainly in well, it depends on the Genus 1, the cutoff is, is on the like 10 minutes. Yeah. Genus 2, the cutoff is just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Closer yeah. in. Yeah, I mean, uh, but it's still probably like. I'm guessing it's something like 10 or 12 or 15 or something, so we haven't hit it yet. And in Genus 3, we're basically federated. I just want to wrap it up. I factor of two, I don't think make a difference. Factor of like four, five, that was, that was, that was, that was, that was